Good morning, everybody. So today we are spotlighting another one of our missionaries that we support here at Adventure Church. Uh, we are blessed and honored to have Dan Herod with us today. Um, and Dan is the director of Youth Alive, where they work with 6th through 12th grade students. And he's here this morning to uh, share about his involvement and how Youth Alive blesses those students. So please welcome Dan Herod. Hello, everyone. It is nice to meet you. I know sign language because my dad is deaf. Growing up, if I wanted to eat, I had to learn how to sign. I am just kidding. Ha. 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 Can I teach you some sign language? This is how you say yes. This is how you say no. Great. Copy what I do. Nice job. Let's do it again. God is in control. The specific signs I just taught you actually communicate the sovereignty of God. In these next few moments that we have together, you have an opportunity to experience truth that will empower you to live a better life than you've ever been living ever before. By the end of our time together, I'm believing that hearts will be set free. I'm believing for physical healing and I'm believing for a spirit of perseverance to erupt out of every person of faith in this room and everybody joining us online. Youth Alive is committed to helping every student live the best life possible. Helping students live healthier is a privilege. And today, I brought my family. And uh, if it's okay, I want to show you some pictures real quick. This is my amazing bride, Marlena, and we've been married for 19 years. She's the most amazing woman I've ever met. She is the picture of perseverance. She is the embodiment of grace. I've never met, never met a woman as strong as she is. She is my hero. She's my best friend. I can't thank God enough for her. We've got great kids. I'll show you Logan and Camden. Logan is 14 years of age. He likes playing piano, soccer, and Xbox. <laughs> He's decent at all three. This uh, little ball of joy standing next to him. Don't be deceived by those twinkly eyes. Okay. Her name is Camden, and she is 18. Does anyone have any children in your lives like that? Let me pull you into our living room. The other day, she was being super cute. I'm talking super cute. And I was like, Cammie, sometimes you're so cute I can't stand it. She looks at me. She says, do you want to know what I can't stand? And I was like, what? Like, she's totally just... I was like, what? Tell me. She goes, I can't stand your jokes. <laughs> I was like, that's cute. And you're grounded for life. But as a family, 
we're committed to this idea. Every student matters. Every student matters. Within minutes of this building and within driving distance of everybody watching online, there are students today, 6th to 12th graders, who are navigating a space in time that has never existed before. Never have we ever experienced what we're experiencing right now. And some of you are like, Dan, we've experienced world wars. Yep, we have. Dan, we've experienced pandemics. True story, Joe. Dan, we've experienced economic turmoil. Yes. Dan, we've experienced racial unrest. Yes, we have. But have all four shown up at our door on the same day? No. Not this way. And here's why that matters to the American teenager. It's because this has changed everything. This is the glowing rectangle. The smartphone. I love technology. And I love using technology. I'm nervous when technology uses people. Picture when you're 12 years old and you've got a device that was handed to you five years earlier. You've been staring at a glowing rectangle for hours every day for years. And just a quick show of hands, how many of you think the average American checks their smartphone more than 25 times a day? How many of you would say more than 50 times a day? How many of you would say more than 75 times a day? Some of you are like, until he gets to a million, I ain't quitting. <laughs> the average is 90. And if you understand averages, you know that means some are way over the limit. And some are way under the limit. I was talking to a group of teenagers a while ago, and I shared the number 90. And there was a kid on the front row, and he's like, lightweight. So I was like, dang, son, you got a problem. <laughs> Let me bring that to the cross. 90 times a day, the average American checks your smartphone. So picture yourself at 14, and 90 times a day, you've been staring at a glowing rectangle with apps designed with one goal in mind, and apps are the computer programs that run on your devices. They're designed and built on something called an algorithm. That algorithm is a computer program that achieves a goal, an outcome. The only goal and the only outcome of every single app on your phone and your tablet is to get you to stare longer at your phone or your tablet. Somebody else said it way better than me. If you ever get handed something for free, you're the product. And so these apps are awesome. I mean, brilliantly designed by some of the sharpest minds on the planet. And I think it's great for us to use technology. I'm nervous when technology uses us. So now picture yourself at 17 and you've been using technology for over a decade of your life, and your mind has been triggered by millions of signals from the glowing rectangle, millions at that point. And now your neural pathways are influenced by the glowing rectangle. Today's American teenager needs to know that there's a hope because the glowing rectangle, it's been proven, is making us, not just teenagers, but it's making us more anxious. Way more anxious. But there's hope. And I think, specifically in Siren and the surrounding counties, we can do something to reach the teenagers in this area. And one of the ways that Youth Alive does this is through school assemblies. I get to work with some of the best communicators in the nation to students. And this group of gentlemen, they travel the country to bring hope to students just like the ones who live in Siren. And the gentleman on the screen you're about to see, his name is Terrence Talley. And he and I were working together in a community hours away from here in Wisconsin. And he was bringing this message. And his message is so simple. Don't give up. Keep going. And we had a band with us. And they were playing this song. It was called 
you belong here. And they wrote it with another group of musicians. You may have heard of them. They're called 10th Avenue North. And so Terrence's message is so clear. Don't give up. And the band played a song called You Belong Here. Do you understand the message? Don't give up. You belong here. And I know somebody in this room needs to hear that today. Somebody watching online needs to be reminded that you cannot give up. Because you belong here. There's hope for tomorrow. So keep going. One of the most epic moments of our current point in global history happened three days ago. If you're following the news, you know what I'm talking about. The president of Russia invaded the sovereign state of Ukraine under a pretext of lies and deception. U.S. and British intelligence called it for months. Vladimir Putin's going to invade Ukraine. And the world was like, no, he ain't. And they kept on saying, look, there's 100,000 troops on the borders. And the world was like, Psh, calm down. And then two weeks ago, there's like, there's 150,000 troops on the borders. And everyone was like, uh... What are you up to, Mr. Pooty Poot? And he's like, nothing. Look the other way. <laughs> and on Thursday, the sovereign nation of Ukraine had one of the greatest military powers unleashed on it. And for now, three days straight, a peaceful nation has been bombed, missile striked, has had paratroopers dropped into it, helicopters flying through its sky, jets tearing through the air. For three days, Ukraine has not known peace. And so the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, was given an opportunity two nights ago to evacuate. The United States government was like, President, Mr. President, you have to leave your country. You're in danger. We can give you a ride. We'll send our special forces in. We will get you to safety, sir. Multiple news outlets reported his response, and I need you to hear what he said. You ready? The fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. That is one of the bravest things I've ever heard anybody say in my entire life. He knows what he believes in. He knows what he's fighting for. And I wonder if that same sense of courage could live within us today, here. That same sense of belief, I know what I believe in. I know what I'm fighting for. I don't need an exit, I need ammunition, I need strength, I need perseverance. And so now back to that school assembly with Terrence Talley and the band. Don't give up, you belong here. In the middle of that moment, an eighth grade boy stood to his feet, sprinted out of the room. That was different, that does not happen. He ran down to the counselor's office and he said, help me. That was the day he was going to give up on the gift of life. He had his plan, he had his place, and that was his day. But then Youth Alive and Terrence Talley showed up at his school. And we got there because some students in that school brought something just like this to their principal and said, can we bring youth alive to our school? So a young man's life was saved because a young student at her high school emailed her principal and said, can we do this? Lives are being changed because of youth alive. I wanna show you a graphic of where we've been since 2010. Over 220,000 students all over the state, all over the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, have heard our message of hope. During the day, it is mental health messaging. We never bring any religious content into public schools. 
we get to share the gospel message at night in a separate event that the church leads. And you see the number, 220,000 students have heard this message. Over 14,000 students have heard the gospel message. Over 2,000 have said yes to Jesus' invitation into abundant life. How many of you think that that's good news? Absolutely. Now, don't take this the wrong way, Adventure Church. Pastor CJ, do not be offended, but I blame all of you for all of this. Because I can't do what I do without you. And every missionary that Adventure Church supports cannot advance on the front lines without support. So thank you. And we've got work to do. We absolutely have work to do. Now, I know I waxed eloquent on all the evils of social media, but now I'm going to ask you to follow me on Facebook. <laughs> and Instagram. Okay, I know. I'm, I'm revealing duplicity on epic levels. I know. But follow us online. Stay connected with us. But we've got work to do. We've got work to do. In these next few moments, what I'm about to share has the potential to change your life it could seriously change the course of the rest of this year for you and empower you to live until eternity. You see, um, there are moments in life that define us and how we handle those moments matter. And how you believe in those moments changes everything. And I think all of us have been lied to and some of us are believing the lies. And over these next few moments that we have, I want to unpack and turn the light on of three lies that we've believed and give you the counterbalancing truth so that you can live a great life. Have you ever had someone uh, tell you that God would never give you more than you could handle? Yeah? yeah? Were you tempted to give them more than they could handle? Like, why do we say that? I mean, is that even true? And I think we, we're under the illusion of a God that isn't real when we say that. Several years ago, I was watching a movie with some friends. It was Avatar in 3D for the second time. If you've never seen Avatar, let me help you out. Take the 1990s epic Dances with Wolves. A foreigner infiltrates an indigenous people in a, an attempt to dominate them, but suddenly falls in love with their ways and embraces their traditions. Okay, that one right there. Boom. Storyline, add giant Smurf aliens. You've got Avatar. You have seen Avatar. Okay, you're welcome. But I'm watching Avatar now. And my left eye is burning. I'm like, what, what's going on? And I'm starting to have tears come down the left side of my face. I'm like, this is not normal. Avatar's not th that type of movie. And I'm like, this is really strange. So I get to the end of the movie, and I'm like, something's wrong with me. And so my friends and I, we all go to Culver's, which is um, what Jesus would do. And so I'm sitting at Culver's now, <laughs> enjoying everything. Man, I think there's a portal to heaven in that kitchen. I'm not going to lie. Those cheese curds are golden. So I think now I am witnessing this moment that will forever change my life. I am crying out of half my face at Culver's, and my friends are like, why is this so serious for you, Dan? Like, I have no idea. And I get home. I look in the mirror, and this side of my face, it's paralyzed. I tried to smile, and my mouth pulled to the right side of my face. I tried raising my eyebrow, and this one was like, no. And I look at Marlena. I'm like, look at me. I'm hideous. And she says, it's not that bad. And I'm like, time out. If half my face not working is not that bad, how ugly am I? I needed to know. Like, tell me the truth, please. Get to the doctor the next day. He tells me I have Bell's palsy. After I discovered he was not name-calling me but diagnosing me, I was like, well, okay, what do we do about this, doc? He said, take these pills. In two weeks, you'll be just fine. I started popping those like Flintstone chewables. I wanted to get better. <laughs> 10 million strong and growing. That's for everybody 40 and above. So now I'm taking these pills religiously, and I'm not getting better. And I had to preach every week with my face paralyzed. I had to lead music regularly. So I play guitar and sing. And I had to do that in front of people for not one week, 
not two weeks, not three, not one month, not two months, not three. It took five months before my face started cooperating with me. I went to bed every night for months, taping my left eye shut every night. It was painful emotionally. It was painful physically. And I was beyond myself. I was past my limits. It was awful. So when people would tell me God would never give you more than you could handle, I'm like, what does that even mean? And is that even true? The answer is no, it's not true. And here's why I believe that. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus is talking to his friends the disciples, and he tells them this right here. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus, in the verses before that, gives them all kinds of bad news. It's going to get difficult. Life is going to go sideways on you. People are not going to like you all the time. It's not going to be good. He basically is saying, buckle up, Betty, and hold on, Harry. It's about to get bumpy. That's what he's telling them. And the word that Jesus uses here is called tribulation, which is just a fancy way of saying, ouchie, mama. That's what he's telling them. <laughs> he gives them a bad news sandwich. First layer, the bread. Hey, in me you can have peace. Jesus, I like peace. Thank you for that. The meat. You're going to have trouble. Jesus, I don't like that. But then he gives them the bottom layer. I've overcome the world. Oh, I like that. Yeah, sign me up. But he hands him the whole sandwich. And if we are going to follow Jesus, we have to accept the whole sandwich. We cannot remove pieces of the truth because we don't like it. So the lie is God would never give you more than you can handle. The truth is, God would never give you more than he can handle. And that matters. Because that means you don't have to be strong all the time. It means you don't have to know what to do next every day. Because God knows what to do next all the time. You don't have to have all the answers. Because God knows all the answers. So Jesus is saying, in me, you can have peace. Let me be your shelter. Let me be your fortress. Let me be your stronghold. Let me be the place that you abide in and you have peace in. Let me be that for you, Jesus is telling you today. And it's so important that we understand the power of a lie. I was... Uh, Sitting at home several years ago, I'm a volunteer firefighter, by the way, which is the most legitimate excuse I have as a full-grown man to ride on fire trucks. Okay? Parades are fun. I'm not going to lie. The candy is pretty great. But I'm sitting at home, and I've got a pager that I wear. It's, it's the size of a box of crayons. And on one side, it's got a speaker, and on the top, there's two twisty knobs, and I was sitting at home, and all of a sudden, it activated. And shrill beeps blast out of the speaker, and it starts shaking, vibrating on my hip. And I'm like, ah! Ugh. I never get used to that. And it says that there's a carbon monoxide alarm going off inside of someone's house in my community. Why does that matter? Well, carbon monoxide takes the life of 400 Americans every year. 90% plus of the time we go to these, it's a false alarm. It's a false alarm. The detector just needs to be replaced. Thank God. So that night, I jump off the truck. I've got my helmet. I've got my full coat on. Got my pants and my boots. Got an air bottle on my back. Mask hanging from my neck. And I'm walking towards the house. I'm like, this is going to be like every other call. And my crew had a tool with us. It's called a four gas meter. It can sniff poison. Pretty cool. And so the person at the front of our line, he walks in through the garage into the laundry room. And that detector lit up like a Christmas tree. And it's shaking violently in his hands. We stopped, and we backed out. There was poison 
in that house. So much had filled every inch of the atmosphere that our detector sniffed it three steps into the house. We back out. We put on our masks. We attach to the tanks on our backs, and we go back in. And we find out what caused it. We neutralized it. Gave the homeowner the good update, told him, hey, you need to have that looked at. You're going to be fine, but air out the house, but turn off that appliance. Turn off the gas. That night, their own CO detector saved their life. And I think sometimes in life, there's carbon monoxide in the atmosphere around us. What I mean is this, if oxygen is truth, Carbon monoxide is a lie. If truth helps you think more clearly and gives you strength, lies, they confuse you, they give you blurry vision, and they ultimately lead you to losing consciousness. And so you can leave this room today full of the truth. Here's the second thing that's like carbon monoxide. Time heals all wounds. Have you ever heard that? If that were true, you would never meet a bitter senior citizen. <laughs> You've met him. <laughs> you see him coming a mile away. <laughs> You're like, are you okay? Of course I am. <laughs> like, would you mind telling your face? Please? When I get to my 90s, I want to have thick, rich laugh lines at the corner of my eyes. I want to laugh so much that I nearly sprained my diaphragm. I want to live a great life. But the truth is, time does not heal all wounds. Case in point, I was playing basketball when I was in eighth grade. I was trying to impress a girl. It did not go well. Why? Because I can't play basketball. I'm terrible at basketball. But there she was, and I was like, this is my moment. I was driving towards a basket. I jumped, twisted, tripped, fell on my back, and I felt lightning shoot down both my legs. I found out months later as I sat in an MRI tube that I herniated a disc in my back, surgery was next. And so now, it's a day of surgery. I wake up, and I'm in my recovery room. And the nurse walks into the room, and she said the meanest thing to me. Get up. And I'm like, I don't want to. She said, no, you have to. I said, no, I don't. She said, no, no, you need to. And she called in another friend and was like, mm -mm. Mm -mm. So they helped me sit up ever so slowly. And I remember, oh, my goodness, I can still feel it. My back aches just thinking about it. They helped me sit up and they helped my feet rotate off the edge of the bed. And they lowered my feet slowly to the floor. And the scar on my back is only this big, but it felt like my whole back was on fire. And so I grabbed the IV pole, and I stood to my feet. I'm only 14, folks. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And I do the shuffle. You know what I'm talking about? And I make my way around the floor, and I get back to my bed, my luxury hospital bed, and I lay back down. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Now, why did she make me do that? Because I would have been at high risk of infection and greater injury if I wouldn't have moved. Sometimes you have to cooperate with your own healing. Time doesn't heal anything. All time does is create space between when you are injured and when you are healed. And what you do in this space between determines whether or not you are healed. So the second lie, the second layer of carbon monoxide in our belief system is that time heals all wounds. That's not true. What you do with time can heal everything. 
Here's the third and final lie. Everything happens for a reason. Have you ever heard that? Would you please put the picture of my children up? Somebody's missing from this picture. Her name's Peyton. She would be 12 this October. And when she was just 13 months old, my wife laid her down for a nap. And um, she never woke up. And 11 years ago, I had to come face to face with all three layers of the lies that I had believed. Because that was more than I could handle. But I learned it's not more than God can handle. Time did not heal me. But as I cooperated with my own healing, I am now healed. And the third lie is that everything happens for a reason. And I remember at Peyton's funeral, we are three feet from where she lay. And people drove for miles to, to comfort us. And somebody approached me and Marlena in our grief and said, everything happens for a reason. And the only thing I heard was God caused your daughter to die because he's got a reason, so trust him, okay? And I know that's not what that person meant. And every time I said it before that moment, I didn't mean that either. But that is what is communicated when any of us say, everything happens for a reason. Today you can be free from that lie. And in Romans 8, 28, we see this truth, and it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Do you know that you can leave this room with rock-solid confidence in the creator of all things who will divinely give your pain a purpose that is beautiful? 2018, I was sitting in my Lazy Boy. It was on my birthday, March 2nd. My phone rang. It's my mother-in-law. Who I genuinely like. She said, did you hear the news? I said, no. She said, your neighbor's daughter just died. I said, what? <laughs> I began to cry. As I thought about my neighbors who watched their beautiful baby girl get ripped from their hands by the by the clutches of death. <laughs> I'm like, God, this is not right. But I began to marvel as I considered what happened and what brought me to that point. Because in 2011, my daughter died. In 2014, we bought a house. Well, technically, we're borrowing it from the bank, but that's another sermon. And then in 2018, my neighbors lost their daughter. How did that happen? Did God cause my daughter to die? No. Did God cause Evelyn, their daughter, to die? No. But will he give their deaths a purpose? Yes. So the lie that you can stop believing today is that everything happens for a reason. The truth, the oxygen that your soul desperately needs to live and thrive and survive is this. God gives everything that happens a purpose. And if you will rise up, woman of God, and rise up, man of God, and embrace the truth that even if the gates of hell are unleashed fully against you, God will not let you fall. And I wonder if we could rise up today. And I wonder if we could believe that God is for us and not against us. And if you need to understand this clearly, let me help you. The cross of Jesus Christ clearly communicates that God himself would rather die and live a rejected life and experience the fullness of death than subject you and I to death. That's what the cross means. 
Heaven would rather die than see you die. But again, it's your choice. Because God won't force his way into any of your lives. He won't force you to believe him. He invites you to trust him. That's how much he loves you. Instead of kicking down the door of your heart like a SWAT team, he knocks. He's like, if you, if you let me in, I can help you. If, you. if you invite me in, we can sit down together and I can help you heal. And I remember after my daughter died, whew, I got angry a lot. And I remember one night I let it fly. I peppered the heavens with so much disrespect I thought I was going to get crushed from the hand of God. But after the dust of my rage settled, I sensed the presence of Christ patiently waiting, kindly sitting next to me, saying, okay. I hear you. And that was a game changer for me. And there are some of you in this room that you think God is mad at you. He's not mad at you. His full wrath was poured out on Christ so that he could turn his face towards you so that you could live an abundant life. So that you can see his smile and approval and his acceptance for you. That's how beautiful God is. And so today in this room, I just want to challenge you to silence the lies and embrace the truth. The lie is that God would never give you more than you can handle. That's, that's not true. The truth is God will never let you experience more than he can handle. So trust him. The lie says time will heal everything. The truth is, what you do with time can heal everything. And the lie says, everything happens for a reason. But the truth is, God gives everything that happens a purpose. So trust him. He's worth it. And so are you. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your peace. And in this moment, Jesus, I ask you to heal people in the room right now. Specifically praying for cancer to be stopped in its tracks, to shrivel and to die. For sight to be restored, for muscles to work right and to activate. God, for hearts who are depressed, to know that they're not doing anything wrong. Sometimes we're depressed, and it's okay. Would your peace permeate every heart in this room, everybody watching online with us? We know you're able, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. We would like to thank you for joining us for service this week. Adventure Church is a tool within God's toolbox that he is using to further his kingdom. If you have been blessed by this ministry, please consider giving. Your generous donation will ensure we're able to continue to provide these online services many people have come to rely on. You can find a safe and easy giving link within the description of this video or one of these three options you see here. Thank you in advance for your generous donation. Thank you.